Okay, uh, good evening and hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to Stars Over Springfield for March 2021. We'll give everybody a few moments to get in. So thanks very much to everyone for coming by. Uh, we would be uh, glad if you introduce yourself down in the chat, if you'd like to do that. Um, glad that you uh, joined us for tonight. We, I think we have a great program lined up. Um, I do see the attendee count now. It does seem to be leveling off, so we'll get going um, in a moment. Uh, I am here. I am Kevin Kupchinski. I work in the uh, planetarium. I'm a planetarium and STEM educator at the museum. We're here with Mike Kerr, who is our uh, principal of innovation and advancement here at the museums. Uh, he's helping with the chat. And then we're here with Rich Sanderson from the Springfield Stars Club, along with our guest Ed Fates of the Springfield Stars Club. Um, and we're going to uh, have a, a nice program tonight. We're going to have a presentation about, as you might be able to see on your screen, we have a presentation on the Hubble Space Telescope from Ed. Uh, then we will do a uh, brief um, observing and night sky segment, and we'll end up with maybe a couple of updates uh, from the Perseverance on Mars, or a couple of items about that. And so it should make for, should make for a great evening. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Rich Sanderson, president of the Springfield Stars Club. Stars Over Springfield is an event that the uh, museums uh, put on, but we, it wouldn't be the same if we didn't have the help and participation of members of the Springfield Stars Club, and we are very grateful for that. So, um, yeah, Rich, maybe you uh, could tell us a little more about the club. Thank you, Kevin. Before Richard speaks, sorry, Richard, to interrupt. Um, <laughs> I wanted to remind people that we are recording this session this evening. Uh, thanks, Mike. Okay, and I'm going to buy, uh, sorry, Richard. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, it's good information, Mike. Um, thanks, Kevin. Um, as Kevin said, I'm the president of the Springfield Stars Club, which is an amateur astronomy club that meets at the Science Museum in Springfield um, when there's no pandemics going on. Um, it's a club that's been around since 1934. A very uh, active club of people of all ages and, and interest levels, but everybody shares a common interest in the night sky, astronomy, telescopes, astrophotography, space exploration. Um, it's just a, a varied group of people with a lot of different interests. And, and we, we meet once a month at the museum from September, September through May and have a guest speaker every month. And then um, a social, uh, hour afterwards. Now with the pandemic, we've been doing it on Zoom. So we're, we're still having our meetings, but we're doing it over Zoom. And so anybody with an interest in astronomy is welcome to join the Stars Club. Um, all you have to do is contact me. Um, my email is rhs31416 at yahoo.com. That's rhs31416 at yahoo.com. And just tell me you want to be put on our mailing list. We normally charge $25 a year membership dues, but because we're not having our meetings at the museum um, for the time being, we're not, we've waived dues for now. So if you want to join, you don't have to pay a cent. We'll put you on our list and you'll get announcements for meetings. Um, the next meeting is going to be um, later this month on March 23rd. Um, a gentleman from Rhode Island who's an expert on space exploration is going to talk to us about the various missions that have gone to different comets, uh, six, six comet missions conducted by NASA and, and different space agencies to explore um, these um, visitors from deep space. You may recall um, Comet Neowise last year put on a nice show and, and um, there's nothing like getting a a close-up view of a comet through the eyes of a spacecraft that's very close. So that's what he's going to talk about on March 23rd, beginning at, beginning at 7 p.m. Tuesday evening. 
So if you want to um, participate and uh, watch that program and get announcements, um, simply contact me at the email address um, that I mentioned and we'll put you on the list. And I should say that the, the Stars Club and myself in particular are very pleased to be involved with Stars Over Springfield as we have been for many years. And we've had a very productive and, and, and active relationship with the Science Museum. The, the club and the museum have partnered on on many, many different occasions, not only for monthly meetings, but events like um, lunar eclipses and transits of Mercury and different things like that, where we bring telescopes down to the quadrangle and show people the, these different events in the daytime or evening sky. And so it's been a, a very productive relationship for many, many decades. Um, we actually started meeting at the museum back in the 1950s. So it's a it's been a long uh, and, and wonderful relationship uh, between an amateur science club and, and the museum itself. And as I said, in normal times, we hold our mo monthly meetings in the Tolman Auditorium at the museum. And hopefully, uh, perhaps by this autumn, uh, that, that can resume again. So um, I think I've covered it pretty well. Um, I, I should just mention one of our members, um, Caitlin Goulet, who's 12 years old, has her own astronomy newsletter, believe it or not, called the Starry Scoop. And we're all very proud of Caitlin. She's a very experienced amateur astronomer, astrophotographer, observer of the night sky, um, despite her young age. And she actually edits and creates um, an online newsletter called the Starry Scoop. It's two pages. It's aimed at beginners, uh, young, young people or, or adults, um, beginner level. Um, if you'd like to be put on her mailing list, um, just email her at um, starryscoop at gmail.com. That's S-T-A-R-R-Y-S-C-O-O-P, starryscoop at gmail.com. And you'll start getting her monthly newsletter. And Kevin, I guess that's about it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rich. I'm just popping that there. I just popped that into the chat. Um, uh, that e that address, and we will actually have a couple of images from Caitlin later this evening. Um, so, as Rich mentioned, yeah, we uh, uh, we have a, a great uh, partnership, and when we were doing this, and we'll do this again uh, in the museum, the evening, the Stars Over Springfield evening featured a a presentation, a a, a talk. Um, by a, a member of the of the Springfield Stars Club uh, before our um, before our planetarium show, and uh, Ed Fates has been one of those speakers over the years. He I've always enjoyed the presentations that that he gave, uh, and and I'm sure we're going to have another one. It has a lot of enthusiasm for. Uh, our space missions and and gives a very informative and enjoyable uh, program about those. Um, Ed, are you still you still president of Aruna Hill? I, I am not president of Aruna Hill anymore. My role at Aruna Hill is now the lawnmower. The, okay, all I, right. Uh, uh, I, I mow the lawn and uh, keep the telescopes clean. Okay, okay. Um, I was going to ask you maybe to uh, give us a couple words about that. Uh, you can let us know about the lawn anyway. I bet you still know something about it though, Ed. I, I'm still, yeah, I'm still up there frequently. Yeah. Uh, Aruna Hill is 100 acres up in Cummington, Massachusetts at a 2,000 foot hill. The four acres on top of the hill are cleared, hence my lawn mowing duties. Um, and, and we have some great telescopes up there. Um, it's a club, so we have club membership and the club members come up frequently. Um, a lot of clear weekends when the weather's warmer, I am up there stargazing. And what's unique about it is it's 23 miles from Northampton, 20 miles from Pittsfield. It's in the Berkshires and it's dark. So the stars still shine like they're supposed to at Aruna Hill. And that's that's why we go up there. And uh, Labor Day weekend, we always do a big public program other than last year, of course, we couldn't um, call the Aruna Hill days. And everyone's invited to come up and uh, enjoy the property. And you're all welcome to come up and maybe become members at some point. We do several public programs 
once we get past COVID, uh, you know, we'll get back into that routine and uh, doing doing public programs up there. Okay, thanks. And uh, so with that, Ed, go ahead, take it away. We'll look forward to your presentation tonight. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, when I started putting this together, it seems like just the other day I did the 25th anniversary for the Hubble Space Telescope. But the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope was April 24th, 1990. So we're actually, we're coming up on 31 years since the Hubble Space Telescope has been in orbit and doing its science work. So why did we spend billions of dollars to put a telescope in space? Well, it really stems from something that's unique in humans, our curiosity. From ancient times, people have got under this beautiful night sky. And a friend of mine took this picture, not at Aruna Hill, he was at Cape Cod. Um, but we see, see this beautiful nighttime sky and something that excites our souls, it, that excites the poet in us and, and it piques the curiosity in all of us. And we start contemplating the big questions in life. Where did we come from? Where, where, what's our place in the universe? What else is out there? How does this all turn out? How big is the universe? How old is the universe? What happens to the universe over time? And a big question is, are we alone? And this happens to all of us. It happens to me every time I get out in front of a dark nighttime sky, I start, you know, getting inspired. The, um, the awe that is the night sky, at least it was before we kind of turned on all the street lights and had distractions of the internet and, and Zoom. Um, but you can still see beautiful nighttime sky, uh, Cape Cod, uh, Aruna Hill, certainly, uh, out west, out in the deserts, so you, can, you can still enjoy the nighttime sky and it's still inspiring people. So we have the big questions. How old, how big, what's gonna happen? And on April 23rd, 1990, the day before the launch, those questions were still uh, hotly debated. And we started getting information on them, but there were some issues. So here are three people who were heavily involved in the Hubble Space Scope, tele, the Hubble Space Telescope mission long before it was on the drawing board. And the first, and I think one of the most important is this lady on the left. And she's from Massachusetts. Her name is Henrietta Swan Levitt. And her job title was computer, not astronomer. Harvard University paid her because she was really good at arithmetic. And they would pay her not very much to sit there and crunch numbers uh, around astronomical questions. And one of the things she did was she figured out this wonderful relationship between these certain kinds of variable stars that changed their brightness over the period of days or weeks and how far away from us they were. And this was very important because it gave us like the first, what's called the standard candle, standard candle allowed us to measure distances to distant stars in, in our own Milky Way galaxy initially. Her, her boss got a lot of credit. Eventually she got some credit, but uh, it was really her boss that uh, uh, got credit for her discoveries. Um, and it was used well by the gentleman we see in the top right picture. And his name is Edwin Hubble. And he was a, had an interesting life. He was a the character, as a newspaper man. He was a boxer at one point in his life. And then he got a PhD in astronomy and he got hired to be the astronomer when the great 200 inch telescope was built atop Mount Palomar in California. And he built on some of the work of Henrietta Swan Levitt and with this new very powerful telescope out on Mount Palomar, figured out that the galaxies were all receding from each other. Our Milky Way galaxy was moving away from every other galaxy he could see out there. And it tied into something called the expansion of the universe. So 
suddenly our fixed Newtonian world of the fixed stars out there was completely changed. We were in an expanding universe. So we try to answer these fundamental questions, you know, that we got from just, just stargazing. How big is it? How old is the universe? What's happening? Where is it going? And from telescopes on the ground, even the great 200-inch telescope, we can't find out, we could not find out those answers. And there are two primary reasons why we couldn't do it from ground-based telescopes. And the gentleman in the lower right, starting in the 1940s and the 1950s, started pitching for the answer to uncover those secrets. And his name is Lyman Spitzer. And he was a professional astronomer and he was a true visionary. And he saw the advantages of having a telescope that was up in space. Well, the first one we can all guess, uh, you know, we live in the Springfield area, so it's cloudy about a half a third, a half of the time we can't see stars. By putting a telescope up in space, it's never cloudy. Uh, but more important, all of us learned as a, as a child, the nursery rhyme, a twinkle, twinkle, little star. Stars twinkle when you view them from Earth. And the reason they twinkle is because the atmosphere kind of acts as this weak and ever-changing lens that doesn't let you really focus down in fine detail on stars and galaxies. So that limits even the best ground-based telescope of what it can see and what it can do. And the third reason for a space-based telescope is our atmosphere is very good at letting, uh, like the light from the sun and the visual wavelengths come through, the reds, the greens, and the blues. The sun looks white, but it's really all those colors. But our atmosphere cuts off um, starlight in infrared and ultraviolet. It just doesn't let it through. Everybody hears about infrared. That's why we wear, um, you know, some sunscreen, um, you know, the bad effects. But the, our atmosphere blocks most of it. And Lyon Spitzer knew that if he could convince people to set up a telescope in space, we could get by the twinkle effect and we could see more of the wavelength of stars and galaxies. And that would allow us to start to understand things better. So after years and years of design and better rockets, we got to the point where 30, almost 31 years ago, we launched the Hubble Space Telescope, named after Edwin Hubble. Why is it named after Henrietta Swan Leavitt? I don't know. Or even Lyman Spitzer, although he got a later space telescope named after him. Still waiting on uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt's telescope. I'm, ho I'm hopeful. But the Hubble Space Telescope went up on the space shuttle back in 1990. It's the size of a school bus with big solar panels sticking off the edge, um, off the side. It produces uh, 2,100 watts of power while it's in orbit. Can power a hairdryer on your laptop pretty easily, powers everything on the space telescope. And once it went into orbit, everybody kind of was real excited for the first pictures and then disaster. The mirror, this, this great mirror that was supposed to achieve phenomenal results, couldn't focus. Um, the mirror was built just down the road in Danbury, Connecticut, and there was a manufacturing problem that nobody noticed, and the telescope wouldn't focus. Disaster. We spent all this time and money on this great space telescope, and it didn't, didn't work. Fortunately, NASA was pretty smart when they designed the thing, and... They designed it so that the space shuttle could fly back up to it and service it. So there were five missions where the, the space shuttle flew up to the Hubble Space Telescope and made improvements. And the first improvement they made was they fixed the misshaped mirror by putting some other instruments up at the other end where the detectors were. Um, and so that finally, the Hubble Space Telescope was able to reach the promise of what it was designed for. And what did it see? It saw all kinds of great things. Um, this is uh, called the Pillars of Creation. It's in, a, it's in a star cloud that I can see in my backyard telescope from up on Aruna Hill. It doesn't look like this, but this is a cloud of dust and gas. Uh, it's in the constellation Sagittarius, uh, which we can see in the summertime. And new stars are being formed um, 
in this structure. And for the first time at the Hubble Space Telescope, we got this detailed resolution and we could actually see what's going on with uh, the dust and gas collapsing in to, to be forming new stars. So the, the NASA titled this one, the Pillars of Creation, and, and we got new stars in the process of forming. Wonderful. We also saw galaxies. And I mentioned Henrietta Swan Leavitt. We could find um, some very faint galaxies. We could find her Cepheid variable stars. They're standard candles. And when you see one of those, it's just like um, if you see a light in the distance and you know it's a 100 watt bulb and compare it to the 100 watt bulb kind of in, in your bedroom, like right next to me over here, and you compare the brightness, you can actually calibrate and figure out, you know, the further one is dim because it's so far away. Well, that's Henrietta Leavitt's, uh, Swan Leavitt's variable stars. With Hubble, we could, the Hubble Space Telescope, we could see variable stars in very distant galaxies and, and start to get a good measure on things. We could also see things like supernova and other phenomenon that let us start to take a careful measure of really distant objects in our universe and see how fast they were moving away from us. We also caught some galaxies in, in the process of interacting. Uh, this is uh, there's actually about nine or 10 galaxies in this picture, but two main ones kind of got too close to each other and, and we're seeing some disruption um, from one galaxy and it's triggering um, a, a starburst formation, lots of new stars forming. And this is one of my favorite this is one of my favorite images from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's certainly not as spectacular as, as some of the other ones, but um, once they got the mirror fixed about four or five years into the Hubble Space Telescope's lifetime, an astronomer sent in a proposal that he wanted 24 hours of time on the telescope, which is an enormous amount of time. It's a very competitive bid process to be able to use the Hubble Space Telescope. This guy wanted to use it for 24 hours. And what he wanted to do was point the Hubble Space Telescope at the most empty part of the galaxy of the, the nighttime sky that he could find. And I can imagine the review committee hearing that he wanted to use the Hubble Space Telescope to point at nothing. <laughs> and that really was his proposal. Use the Hubble Space Telescope to point at nothing. And he said, by, by observing and integrating, uh, gathering the light from an empty part of the sky over 24 hours, we're going to find out what's really there. And, and this, is, um, this is that deep image. Uh, he was granted the time, good science. And what we found is even in the most empty parts of the night sky, there are galaxies upon galaxies on, upon galaxies. And if we were able to magnify any little part of this, uh, any one of those little dots, most of them are very distant galaxies. So we find the empty part of the sky really isn't empty at all. There's just very distant galaxies that any other telescope cannot see, cannot resolve. The telescopes just aren't, they're limited by our atmosphere and can't image these, but the Hubble Space Telescope can, it's up in space. Now, a lot of people think, well, maybe is the Hubble Space Telescope the biggest telescope out there? Not even close. Uh, the main mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope is about eight feet in diameter. Eight feet is uh, probably the height of my bedroom right here that I'm talking from. That's about eight feet. That's how big the mirror is. It's a very big mirror, um, but if you think of, uh, Back in the 1930s, the 200 inch telescope on Mount, Mount Palomar was three times bigger than that 100, almost 100 years ago, 90 years ago. So it's not the biggest telescope ever built, but it's really the most effective. And that's because it's up in space, the stars don't twinkle, it can get this high resolution, can also see in the intra, ultraviolet and infrared light um, that ground-based telescopes can't do. So <laughs> when, when we look at empty parts of the sky, you, you start to realize what we really have in the universe. And over the 30 years of observations, uh, we, we've done many careful surveys and, and we now are starting to answer some of those fundamental questions that we only dreamed about before the Hubble Space Telescope was launched.
Lots of pretty pictures. Uh, we got uh, stars in the process of exploding. This is a star that uh, went nova and ejected uh, big blankets of gas here. This is the remnant of a supernova from thousands, 10,000 10, years ago, approximately. The Hubble Space Telescope is able to show us the detail and it can come back 10 years later and it will, it, it, on a supernova, in our own Milky Way galaxy, it'll actually have noted some change over time. The res resolution is that sharp. Close up of another star forming area here uh, where new stars are being born. So not only are we answering those big questions, the Hubble Space Telescope started resolving some of the physics involved in, in things like the life cycle of a star, how stars are formed, um, how they go through their life cycle, how they end life as a nova or a supernova um, and go, go back into the galaxy for to, to be recycled and as something else, planets or whatever. Um, like I said, one of the great designs of the Hubble Space Telescope, it was designed to be serviced while well in orbit. And this is one of the last orbital missions. This is a um, NASA astronaut named uh, uh, Katie Thornton, Katie flew four shuttle, three shuttle missions, um, was a mission specialist who would go out and do spacewalks and fix the, whatever they were working on, in this case, the Hubble Space Telescope. And the last mission uh, was many years ago to the Hubble Space Telescope because the shuttle is no longer flying. But on that mission, they put in a new generation of batteries and a new generation of gyroscopes. The way the Hubble Space Telescope points is by gyroscope, needs uh, three dimensions, three different gyroscopes to, to point it in any fine detail. And in the beginning, when they first launched the Hubble Space Telescope, these gyroscopes were wearing out like crazy. But NASA finally figured out over the first 20 years of the Hubble Space Telescope, what gyroscopes, why gyroscopes break down in space. And it has to do with zero G and weightlessness and thermal stress. So they put in a new generation of gyroscopes and those have lasted pretty well because we no longer have a space shuttle to go up and, uh, and repair um, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but it's still going after 31 years and still doing really cutting edge science. And it's much longer than it's designed. The original plan, NASA hoped to get maybe 10 or 15 years out of it. Then they were actually gonna try and bring it back and put it in the Smithsonian. Well, with the problems with the space shuttle that became impractical. So now they're, they hope to get another five years, maybe even 10 years out of it, as long as the batteries and the gyroscopes last. Um, and then they're gonna have it burn up on re-entry, uh, which is too bad because it's, uh, it's been a pretty amazing tool over the years. And here we see from Jupiter and the kind of detail that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope can, can get. No ground-based telescope can do this. Now we do have objects, we have spacecraft that occasionally fly by Jupiter and can get more resolution than this, but uh, this just gives you an example of what it can do. So now 31 years later, what do we know? One of the things we dreamed about was how old is our universe? Big debate before the Hubble Space Telescope was, was launched. Now we know pretty definitively from the measurements of galaxies and supernova and lots of other things, our, our universe is 13.77 billion years old. How big is it? Um, 28 billion parsecs which is 93 billion light years end to end is, is the estimate. Um, a light year is 6 trillion miles. It's a distance light travels in a year, 6 trillion miles. So 93 billion times 6 trillion. I'm not doing that math, but it's, real, it's a real big universe that we live in. And what's the ultimate fate of the universe? This one answer is pretty definitive what we now know. And it's kind of not what I think a lot of the romantics of physicists and astronomers wanted to think. We wanted to think the universe was gonna expand and then contract back down and big bang and bounce again. 
But we now know that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. The universe keeps moving apart at an ever faster rate. So the ultimate fate of our universe, unfortunately, is pretty bleak. It's just going to cool off and spread out and kind of dissipate into, uh, into nothing over time. That's what's going to happen in our universe. Fortunately, it's not going to happen for many billions of years, but, but that is the, the fate of the universe we know pretty well from the measurements of the Hubble Space Telescope. Back when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, we had no concept of dark energy. It wasn't a term physicists use. Um, now with the measurement, we knew about dark matter, but we didn't know about dark energy. Um, the mathematics of the physics, we, we now that know that the universe is composed mainly of this mysterious substance called dark energy. Uh, permeates space. We still don't know too much about it. So we answered many of the questions, the big questions about what we ponder out there, the, where we come from, what's going to happen, where we're going. But one of the questions Kevin talked about a little earlier that we Hubble didn't necessarily be able to answer for us is, are we alone out there? And last week, NASA took a huge step toward trying to answer that question. Perseverance went through its seven minutes of terror, it landed on the moon, on Mars. Uh, and the whole focus of this mission is a multi-year mission with other spacecraft coming to Mars is to answer the question, did life ever form on Mars? Is there any evidence, any fossil evidence or anything else that proves definitively that life evolved on Mars? Um, so Hubble answered some questions. It couldn't answer some, but now we're looking at a next generation looking a lot closer to answer those kinds of questions. Uh, here's perseverance from, um, you know, after it's landed on, on Mars, you know, those rocks on Mars you see over on the right are, you know, the size of your fist. And we're seeing real detail. This thing's going to rover around uh, that whole section of Mars, start digging, uh, reporting back. But the really cool thing is brought their own helicopter. So the Mars atmosphere is really thin, but you know these blades spin really fast and, and this thing is really light and it can fly around the surface of Mars, do some scouting around and find interesting places to send the rover to. So I think that's really amazing that we've got a, uh, a helicopter on Mars now that's doing some observations for us. And uh, that's all I had planned. I hope there's a few questions and I look forward to the planetarium show. Here. There are, Ed. Yes, so there are uh, some questions. We have a question from Alex. When was the biggest spaceship made and who made it? When was the biggest spaceship made? Yeah, that was the, that's the question as it was typed. Um, and we can open that up to the rest of the panel as well. well. I, I can tell you for sure that the biggest spaceship that people ever rode in was the space shuttle. Um, the United States made it. We made five of them. It was retired, uh, what, about eight, nine, ten years ago now? Um, that, was that was probably the largest thing that has ever been launched, in, the largest single piece that has ever been launched into space. And it was done by the Americans. However, many of those space shuttle missions brought up pieces to build the International Space Station. And the Russians and others also set up components to the International Space Station. So if you take the pieces that you put together in space, uh, the International Space Station is the largest thing that humans have set up. And it's almost a big uh, Lego project. Okay, the Americans are going to send up a module, and then the Italians are going to send up a module, then the Russians are going to send up a module, then the Americans are going to send up a bunch of solar panels. And pretty soon you got this huge structure in space that has had up to 10 people at one time um, on the, the International Space Station. And the really cool thing I find is a couple times a month, there's a window of opportunity to actually see that thing fly overhead. And, and I love to do it. I love to get my family out or get, get some friends out, get a group of kids out to say, okay, at uh, 8.15 tonight, the uh, International Space Station is going to fly over and I'll tell them who's on it. I'll look up and see what the particular crew is. And these six people are on it right now. 
uh, and three of them might be asleep as they go over Springfield, Massachusetts. So, I was going to say the USS Enterprise, but I think I I've been in isolation too long. <laughs> that was built in space. <laughs> it's future though, Richard, so it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, the the space. Um, station is really quite bright on some nights it's the brightest object in the sky going over so it is quite easy to see and I know Brian Lapis on channel 22 often tells us uh, when there's a good Passover about to happen so yeah I just added uh, we'll uh, in a couple minutes uh, I'll uh, bring up that website and uh, see what it has to tell us for this month Ed, do you happen to know how bright the Hubble is I've never Looked into viewing the Hubble go over. Is it too dim to see? No, it's not too dim to see. Um, heavensabove.com, heavens-above.com will show you when the Hubble's coming by. Um, it's much dimmer than the space station. It's um, depending on the orientation of its solar panels. It, it can be as bright as um, like the stars of the Little Dipper, about fourth hmm. magnitude. Can be That's a little bigger than that too if it's if it's not oriented correctly. But you can see it. I've I've seen the Hubble Space Telescope go overhead. Hmm. It's it's not as spectacular as the uh, the space station though. The, um, we also have another question: How much gas can Jupiter hold before exploding? <laughs> well, that's a great question. But um, the answer is, if it explodes, it won't really explode. It will more implode. And if it got so much gas where the gravity was pulling the hydrogen atoms together too closely, the hydrogen, atom, the hydrogen atoms would fuse in nuclear fusion. And when that happens, Jupiter is no longer a planet. At that big point, it becomes a star. So if it had more mass, if it had about twice as much mass as it actually has, it would have enough mass to bring the gas together so the hydrogen atoms would crash into each other with some with such force it would go off like a nuclear bomb and jupiter would turn into a star so that's uh that's the answer to how much more gas would jupiter hold as a planet it could hold more but you know at some point it becomes not a planet and it would be really cool if jupiter did become a star because we'd live in a it would be like um star wars we'd live in a, a solar system with two suns <laughs> It would kind of interfere with the dark night sky, though. <laughs> light pollution. Yeah, the ultimate. <laughs> yeah, the ultimate in light pollution. Okay, and I think, um, I believe I've covered everything that I found in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ed. Um, very, uh, very, always very good to see what the Hubble did, it's just such a remarkable run that it's had um, <clears throat> over, you know, over that amount of time. I think so, we all agree it's the greatest scientific instrument of all times. Yeah, yeah, in many, in, in many ways, absolutely. And it happened during our mm -hmm. lives, so how, how lucky are we? So one of the ways you would measure, is it really the greatest scientific uh, tool of all time, is when you look at how many PhDs at how many scientific papers have been published yeah. using the Hubble Space Telescope compared to any other scientific instrument of any kind. Hubble Space Telescope definitely is the most important scientific instrument of all time. Now, I'm not gonna say it compares with you know, uh, uh, CRISPR or some of the stuff going on with DNA, but that's not a single instrument at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a friend of ours, uh, Mike Wenz, who used to be the president of the Astronomy Club at Amherst, is one of the guys that runs the Hubble telescope. If if an astronomer wants to see something, he's the one that aims it and prepares the schedule. And you know, he, he and, a, and a, several other people and a local guy that's actually running that telescope. He's been doing it for years. And uh, he spoke recently about it. And he said, I guess one of the gyroscopes um, went bad, but they've actually found ways to run it with two gyroscopes. They're looking for different ways, preparing for future breakdowns. and. What happens if two, two of them break down? Can we still somehow maneuver it? And they're finding ways to, uh, clever ways to keep on extracting as much science from that telescope as possible. That's very interesting. I always said that's a, that's a great career to think about as a telescope operator. 
because no matter who gets the grant, you get to you get to run the telescope. <laughs> um, you know, if you're an astronomer and you don't get the grant, you're out of luck. <laughs> Um, so that, that could be, that could be a cool, uh, sort of career to look into. Oh, imagine people ask you what you do for a living. I run the Hubble telescope. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, oh, I did, see, I, I did see one more, uh, Q and A come in and that, uh, could the sun explode? Yes. I just noticed that myself, Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the answer is. Absolutely, that's going to be its fate. It's going to explode. Yeah. The good news is the sun is about five billion years old, and it's probably got another five and a half or six billion years before that fate happens to the sun. But it will turn into what we call a nova at some point, and then you know, and when it burns up, when it fuses all the hydrogen it can burn and all the helium it can go through, at some point it'll burst apart in the space um, and recycle itself as space dust. Well, what's fascinating to think about is, even though that's so far in the future, some of our spacecrafts like the Pioneers of Voyager and New Horizons that we made are still be drifting through space even at that remote time through the galaxy. Several of them are already in interstellar space and probably drift for billions of years. We're, um, we're getting great questions. Another one came in is, uh, where's the control center for Hubble? And it's in um, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, originally it was associated with Johns Hopkins University, but it's its, it's own place now um, in suburban Baltimore, Maryland. And when is the successor to Hubble scheduled for launch? Well, in reality, there's been many space telescopes since the Hubble, some, some are in various uh, different wavelengths that focused on infrared or there was an x-ray telescope. Um, but the, the Webb telescope um, is kind of the, the next great visual <laughs> one. And it's, it's supposed to launch within a year. I'm, I'm not sure the, the details of, uh, of the progress on it and whether it's yes. COVID and NASA. I, I've heard an August, um, I'm sorry, October date. And I haven't seen that change yet, the October date. So that's what it's, that's looking, uh, that's what it's still looking like. Um, uh, hopefully they'll be able to, to uh, stay on task. I think they've done a, a pretty good job, you know, even throughout the pandemic of keeping to, you know, close to the original schedule anyway. Um, so, so thanks very much. And keep and do keep uh, uh, posting things and we will look at that. Meanwhile, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen out. As, as I mentioned, we do have some, uh, some images. So here is an image from um, uh, Caitlin Goulet. Uh, this is, it, as I understand, she uses a camera. This is a camera basically aimed at the stars. Um, on a tripod, I don't think this is, this looks like it's too wide of an angle to be through a telescope. Uh, so here's a couple of constellations that you might be able to go out and see. Here's Cassiopeia um, down lower. It sort of has this, um, you know, a lot of times I'll say it's a W or an M shape. It almost is kind of look like an L shape right now. Um, but there it is. It's in the northwestern sky at this point. Um, and we'll see that in the uh, simulated sky view in a minute. And then up above is the constellation Perseus. So, and I believe we've got one more of hers. There we go. Oh, and that's a beauty. Good, yeah, good old Orion, right? Um, there's one thing, you know what? It's cold out, right, in the evenings. And it's, uh, you know, maybe uncomfortable, but we've got the brightest stars, that, or I should say at least, yeah, I mean, definitely one of the, the brightest star, but the biggest collection of bright stars uh, out there uh, to reward you for, uh, for freezing your butt off for a little while. And Orion is certainly the premier one. It's got more bright stars in it than any other constellation. Um, it and throughout history, uh, I should in many cultures anyway. Orion is seen as 
uh, a person, it has somewhat of a resemblance to a, uh, a torso of a person. If you make these two shoulders, these two stars in the shoulders, and down there are knees or sometimes as an upraised foot, and then there's on his waist, there's a belt of three stars, Orion's belt. And um, you can go out and, and see that toward, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, toward that southeastern sky. Actually, let's go ahead, no, southwestern sky. And let's go ahead and take a look um, and take a look at that. So here we are. Here's tonight's sky. It's actually somewhat in the past. This is about what this, this is what the sky looks like at seven o'clock. Um, this the sunset now is the sunset at this at the beginning of the month is about quarter of six. It takes an hour, hour and a quarter to get dark. A little bit there. Uh, you might did you see the big W down there for west? Uh, one nice thing about simulations that they let you know where you're looking. There are no big red letters on the horizon, though. So when you're outside, you need to know your direction. So over to the southwest, there's Orion. And the thing is, again, if you've been watching and 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 watching the stars over uh, over the weeks and and maybe with us since uh, January, we were originally looking over towards the east to see. Orion as darkness falls, and now it is gone past the south and into the southwest. And, uh, and again, this is just about as darkness falls. Orion's belt points almost, but not quite, toward Taurus. And Taurus has a bright star called Aldebaran, a, uh, red, a red giant star. And then next to Taurus right now is the planet Mars. So we've got two reddish objects over there in the southwest sky. And Mars, it, if I zoom in a little bit, maybe you can see better that Mars is very close to, and this is tonight's sky, Mars is very close to the little cluster of the Pleiades. Now, Mars is a planet, and as it orbits, it appears to change its position in the sky. It will not be that close to the Pleiades um, after a few nights. Uh, I don't know if it's clear out tonight. I can't see out the window. Um, it just seems like it's... <laughs> Even though this forecast has been for sunny, it hasn't, we've got a lot of clouds. So that's what the Western sky looks like at the beginning of the month. And let's go to the end of the month now. And that's what the Western sky will look like at the end of the month. Notice that it looks a lot brighter, right? Because sunset gets later. And actually, if you're really paying attention, you might notice that the time changed, right? If, if you've been looking at my display down there, I changed the date to the 31st, but we moved from 19 hours, 1900 hours to 2000 hours. And uh, maybe I'll give the folks a brief second in the chat to just, can anybody post in the chat? Why did the chain, why did that happen? Why did the program change its time like that automatically? Now I say that, and of course, when I share my screen, I lose the chat, so I can't see it. Um, but the answer is daylight savings time. We do have daylight savings time uh, coming in at the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in a couple of weeks on the 12th. So uh, sunset will be at 7.15 at the end of the month. If we didn't have daylight savings, it would have been at 6.15. Uh, so, and notice that as we got the Western horizon, notice that Orion is much closer to the Western horizon by, by the end of the month. Uh, and as we look at Orion's belt and follow it the other way, we get to the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, the dog star. Uh, the constellation in that area is supposed to be Orion's hunting dog. So there's, uh, and now let's come on back to this evening and look to the eastern sky. I'm going to just zoom in just a bit. In the eastern sky, coming up into the eastern sky, we have Leo the lion. We can see that pretty well into the eastern sky now. The uh, round part there representing sort of the back of the head, maybe the mane, okay? And uh, the 
bright star down there representing maybe his heart or this chest, two stars on the back end representing the rear, the back end, and a star for the tail. So we've got a head, a body, and a tail. Uh, and it's not too bad of a lion, actually, for a bunch of stars. I like to think that the lion is crouching, the legs are tucked under, we don't see legs. So that's what you can see at the beginning of the month. By the end of the month, looking over that way, again, yep, the sky gets a little, if you go out at, uh, at uh, uh, th that, if you go out at eight o'clock, and the other thing, so Leo moves up higher into this eastern sky, and we see a bright star just showing up above the horizon. This is the star Arcturus. And there we see in the northeastern sky, the Big Dipper, and the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper arcs around to Arcturus. We say, follow the arc to Arcturus. And when you can do that, at the onset of darkness, that means spring has arrived. Shakespeare even wrote about that as a sign of spring. And sure enough, um, uh, about a week or so before the end of the month, we have the spring equinox and the first day of spring. Uh, and then for just one other highlight, uh, you come back to the southwestern sky. I want to look at the eight, the 18th. And looking at the 18th, and there we are about the southwestern sky. And by the 18th, there's the plea. Let me come in a little bit more. There's the Pleiades. Mars has sort of moved up above. It's been orbiting and it we change our perspective, our angle of viewing it. So it appears to have moved up, but here comes the moon. So we've got uh, between the Pleiades, Mars, the bright star Deberon, and the moon, we're going to have an interesting, um, uh, an interesting view on the 18th. Uh, probably be an interesting view of clouds, but uh, who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. And, and the 19th actually will also be um, pretty interesting. There's as the moon moves up almost um, near Mars. Now remember that this is a simulation and things are, uh, look a little more compact here than they do out in the real sky. So it, it may not be that close in the real sky, but it'll still be pretty close and still be pretty interesting um, to get out and see that. Um, I see a question in the Q&A. Isn't um, Polaris the brightest star? Um, Polaris is the North Star. So we move to the northern part of the sky. There's, there's our Big Dipper, these two stars up above. And if we follow, there is Polaris, the North Star. And remember that that Sirius did look a lot bigger than that. The idea of Polaris is not that it's very bright, but that it is in this position, which is almost directly above our North Pole. So that as, this, as the sky appears to move, as the earth spins, and uh, let's simulate that here, as the earth spins, and it, it makes the sky appear to move, and the North Star is apparently at the center of that motion. So that's what makes it a special star. It's actually about the 50th brightest star, which out of 7,000 visible stars, that's actually still pretty good. Um, uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not spectacularly bright anyway for a star. Um, and, oh, I see, uh, and Gemini is over near, somebody's asking about Gemini. Gemini is over near Orion. So if you find Orion, look uh, sort of above, maybe and not even too much above, over to the left of Orion. And there are the stars Castor and Pollux. And I don't know why this program simulates them with such different brightness. I'm sorry, because that's, that's, ah, that's because that's Procyon. There, it is above and to the left. 
of, uh, of Orion. So I'm going to just zoom out a little bit to get a little better. There's Orion above and to the left. There's Castor and Pollux, Gemini. That is the little dog there, uh, the star uh, Procyon um, below. So um, there's, again, a, just an abbreviated look at the night sky and some, uh, some highlights that you might see. But let's go ahead. Um, as I, somebody asked about the, the space station we mentioned, this is the site, Spot the Station uh, from NASA. And if you put in your city or town, it will give you little map markers of areas where it's figured out where you might see the, the uh, space station. Now they don't predict too far in advance. So you click on your, your site, you click viewing opportunities and scroll down the screen. There we go. So it, it predicts only about 10 days or so in advance. So the number you want to look at is right here in the middle and Bang, there we go, 76 degrees. This number tells you how high above the horizon um, the, the space station will be. Zero degrees is right on the horizon um, and not even worth thinking about. 90 degrees is straight over your head. So you're going to get a heck of a neck ache maybe trying to see that one. But, um, so, but basically, the higher the number, the better, and especially over uh, maybe about 20 or so degrees. And so what is, that's on the ninth, OK? Oh, you're going to have to get up kind of early for that one, though. No? OK, and um, is that the duration really only for a minute? No, I'm sorry, six minutes. There we go. I'm looking at the wrong line. I'm sorry, and I'm looking at the, well, 6.12 a.m. Um, for, uh, for six minutes. So you're, you're starting to flirt with uh, sunrise. But it's so bright that it will show up in a sort of a dusk, sort of a dusky sky. Um, so, and especially it, let's see, it shows up and then it, it's going to show, let's see, it appears... Where is that? 14 degrees above uh, northwest. Okay. Now, if you take your, um, uh, if you hold your arm out and make a fist and hold that up against the sky, that makes about 10 degrees. Okay. So if you sort of put that at the, put the bottom of your fist at the horizon, the top of your hand is about 10 degrees above the horizon. Um, give or take, of course. So there, uh, there you have it. So there's, and what date was that again? The, the 10th. No, I'm sorry. The, the 9th. Okay. And it looks like 37 probably isn't that, well, there's 61 on the 12th. Uh, so it looks like, and that's just up until the 14th. Like I said, they don't predict too far in advance. So uh, spot the station, spot the station. Uh, and I believe you can actually just put in spotthestation.com and it will take you. No, you have to do is .nasa.gov. Uh, spotthestation.nasa.gov. And it'll, it'll land you on that site. Uh, so what I wanted to do um, for Mars is look at, you know, we, we've seen some spectacular pictures. And what I wanted to do is maybe sort of just take a step back and put it in a little perspective as well as maybe look at at least one picture. And um, let's, where, you know, we've got that great detail of where it is, but where is it? Where in the world or where in the Mars is, uh, is, is perseverance? So this is sort of a stretched out and flattened out map of Mars. And it is color coded for height. So the red and the yellow are very high areas. The blue are very low areas. And the green is in between. Okay, and as, so as you look and you see Jezero Crater is labeled over there, so somewhat north of the equator, and you've got this big round 
uh, thing here. This is an impact crater, an impact basin, a huge impact way in the past um, of, of Mars. And uh, Jezero Crater is a much later crater on the edge of that. And so what's interesting is that you've got this flat area, you've got the highland areas, and then Jezero is in this um, intermediate area. So it's going to have very, very interesting, very interesting terrain. And it is sort of, uh, and it, it's a crater and it, seems to have filled with water. And again, now there's that again, and Jezero is um, up in that area, up in that area there, uh, again, and just in this border area. And uh, let's see, so I've also got up a couple of websites. There we go. So now this is from the Mars uh, orbiter. And, you know, there's the Mars orbit is kind of an unsung hero in a lot of our space missions. It really gives us a great view of Mars and it is relaying all the information from our ground, our ground in instruments or most of the in in information from now Perseverance and from previous uh, from previous rovers as well. So let's see if we go in and is that, yeah, that's the full screen. Okay, so now here is a close up of, we're sort of in Jezero Crater now. Uh, it, it takes up a much larger area around this view. And the circle is kind of what they were aiming at. And this thing of course is where they put it where it got put down. And this over here, this is an inflow. This, at least for all the world, this looks like an, where water flowed in and left a delta and Jezero Crater was a lake. And here's the delta of the, of the river or the, the stream of water emptying into the lake. And in other views, we could see uh, on higher views of this, you could actually see uh, on the other way over, uh, way over, whoops, way over to the side, uh, to the left where, where the water flowed out again. So it's right near, this is I think only about a kilometer or so uh, from the Delta, which is less than a mile. And so it is poised to investigate this area that was shallow water. And, and, that's, a, and that's a prime area to look for signs of life. And so here is a panorama view from Perseverance. And unfortunately, I don't know which way we're looking really, uh, but this, this is one of the images, the first panorama image that it sent back. And you can really go on and do this whole, um, this whole 360 thing with it. Uh, and just look at the, look at the detail, isn't this, uh, these boulders just stand out. Look at all the little, all the small rocks in the immediate um, vicinity of the rover, and then out in the distance, the sides of the crater, um, and possibly the foothills, so to speak, of that of that delta. Um, it's an area that looks for all the world like water has just flowed over, left sand deposits, strewn boulders and rocks all over the place. Uh, so we probably have a lot to look forward to from this. It seems to have landed in fine condition and is, is sending us back um, all of this. And I know when I was looking at this before, there are some rock outcrops in here with some pretty amazing detail. That just, that's like a spherical rock right there to the right. You're right there, right? Yeah, yeah oh, look, that's yeah. fascinating. And 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 so volcanic bomb, maybe or something. Maybe and maybe it's also been tumbled in in some hmm. water. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, and, and it could be both. Uh, one thing is on Earth, we know that the way to make a rock roundish, even like this other one here 
to sort of smoother and roundish and not all jaggedy is that they're if they they're in flowing water. Sure. And they've been jumbling around in the flowing water. Um, it's kind of like if anybody's ever had a rock tumbler, right? Uh, it's sort of the it's sort of the same thing. Um, there, but there are some rock outcrops here that just show an amazing amount of layering, or maybe that's over on the side that we can't see. But anyway, so there's this is uh, you know this is I think what we have to look forward to, as well as some of those views from that. Uh, from the Mars orbiter as well. well look, look at that vertical rock there. It was like tumbled on its side or something. This one right here? Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah, almost like it's standing up. But yeah, like a huge flood maybe. Um, I guess the moving water would have the same force, but with less gravity, it could tumble a larger boulder probably. Yeah, yeah. So remember that Mars is about 60%. Um, what is that? Well, it's 60% the diameter of the Earth, right? But it's smaller in mass, and so it, there's less of a force of gravity on things. So the same amount of force will have sort of more, um, more effect there. Uh, so anyway, and the hill, even the the detail on the hills in the distance is pretty amazing. So anyway, we this is uh, we've got a lot to look forward to. I think from this mission. Uh, you know, and not just cool pictures, but as Ed was saying, it is designed to look at least for pre preliminary ideas and, and, and hints of was there something alive on Mars? Those alive things would be microbes, right? Uh, bacteria and so on, because by the time Mars dried up, if you look at Earth, uh, at the time that Mars sort of uh, uh, dried up, that's all that was there on Earth was bacterial type of things. So, um, and, and it will be taking samples from maybe this soil. Here we go. Um, look at the detail in that rock outcrop in the, in the layering there. Uh, you know, again, this in on Earth, this is this is stuff that's deposited in water. These are layers that are deposited in water. So, uh, you know, if it really has been a, a lake bed or was a lake in the past, it's got prime chances of having some signs of life, and then it's going to collect samples, store those samples, and a future mission is going to go down and pick up those samples, bring them into orbit, transfer them yet to another vehicle that will bring them back to Earth. So uh, that's not all going to happen for a while. I think that final return isn't due until the early uh, 2030s. So, um, uh, you know, definitely a lot to look forward to. Now, Somebody wants to know why Mars looks red. So why, why does it look red? Um, if you think of rust is probably a, a good way of thinking about it that there's in this is a lot there's a lot of iron uh it had oxidized in the past and that's what we and again notice as i've been panning around it looks like this everywhere and any panorama or any picture that's come back from any of our rovers looks like this in the sense that it's just all this reddish color. So there's no wonder why Mars looks red to us when we look up and we see that dot up in the sky. But okay. what's fascinating, Kevin, is just mm -hmm. 75 years ago, astronomers were struggling, looking at a little tiny fuzzy orb and, yeah, huh? up and they could just see dusky markings. And now you can, you can see little pebbles the size of a, of a quarter and and even microscopic views of the surface through the instruments. It's amazing the, yeah, yeah, how, how, I, how much we progressed in such a short time and how lucky we are to, yes. to be alive now to see this, this age of exploration that, that we're in right now. Right, and some of the scientists might have even seen this in their lifetimes too. Um, pretty, um, uh, pretty amazing. So Mike, is anything, in, are there any questions in the chat? Um, Nope, no questions right now in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna, all right, then I'm gonna stop sharing because I couldn't see, um, I couldn't see the chat. And I, I it probably, uh, if, um, 
I think we, if we're good on questions, I want to thank everyone for coming by again tonight. Uh, get on out there, enjoy the sky over the next month. We'll do this again on the first Friday in April, and we hope to see you then. Have a, a great night, have a great weekend, have a great month, and and we'll 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 see you then. Good night, folks, and and, and Ed, great job. That was a wonderful talk. Yeah, and thanks again to Ed. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, Ed. Again, an another another wonderful and uh, entertaining talk and, and informative. Yeah, so, and thank you, Kevin, for the presentation, and Richard Sanderson and the Springfield Stars Club, and Ed. Thanks very much, and thank Caitlin. You. Thank you for the photos. Ed, yes, thank yes, definitely, definitely. Okay, um, take care. Have a great month. Hope to see you next month.